All right, it's 2 p.m. So I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, so I'll give a little quick introduction about Ryan and then we'll pass it on to him. So hi everyone, thanks for joining us on Lens. I'm Miranda. Uh, I work at a design consultancy called Delve in Madison, Wisconsin. And today's guest is Ryan Hume. He's the co-founder of Acid Rain Technology, an electronic musical instrument company. Ryan graduated from Wash uh, Western Washington University and worked as a designer and brand manager in the housewares industry for seven years after graduation. As a longtime musician and audio engineer, in 2018, he decided to take the plunge into building a company at the forefront of human machine interface and music making. So Ryan, I'm gonna go ahead and pass it off to you here. And thank you. Let me uh, screen share. Can you guys still see me? Yes. Okay, cool. All right, well, trying a kind of uh, new uh, presentation format here. I've been messing around in Webflow. It's a ton of fun. Definitely recommend it for anybody looking to uh, build a site. And I thought I'd uh, build some up in, in that for this. Um, so today I would like to talk about product entrepreneurship for industrial designers and kind of speak to my journey uh, from working in traditional industrial design in housewares uh, as an in-house designer in a company and then kind of pivoting that uh, some of the skills and experience I learned there into building my own company in a space that I've been interested in for a really, really long time. Um, so to kind of demystify what it is exactly that I build, because it's a, a kind of strange um, niche product <laughs> that a lot of people haven't really heard of. Um, they're called Eurorack modular synthesizers. Uh, they're these modules that look like this. You can see that on camera and uh, they plug into a power supply in a case with this cable, and then you patch them together with cables like this. Uh, you patch many different modules together to make an almost unlimited variety of sounds. So it's kind of a, like an ecosystem of different manufacturers and developers that make these things and um, all sell them to musicians that can assemble them in any combination they want. Um, and here's an example of what our product sounds like, <laughs> just to give you an idea. So we make this one right here, you can see our logo. It's a super saw, if there's any uh, music producers or, or audio nerds in the audience here. And it's being played through and, and modulated by a bunch of other modules in this setup that this person is um, uh, recording in the video. So it gives you an idea of kind of how they all work together. And uh, create a musical sound. So uh, I guess a little bit of my background and how I got here. Uh, I was born down in California, but I was raised on a small island outside of Seattle called Bainbridge Island. And my mom is an English teacher and a singer, and my dad is a lettering artist and musician. He actually did the Bugs Life logo. Um, it's one of his big claims to fame. He has really, really cool work. You should check it out at kellyhume.studio. I think my mom and dad are watching today, so hi, mom and dad. Um, and uh, so I grew up in a very musical household as well. And that's had a lot of impact on, on where I've gone in life and, and kind of how I've applied my skills. I learned guitar uh, when I was really young. My dad taught me initially. And then I played in bands through uh, middle school and high school. Uh, there was a really like oddly vibrant music scene on the little island that I lived on. and. Uh, I've, only learned much further after the fact how lucky that was to, to have um, exposure to all of that and uh, be able to, to grow musically at a young age. And then uh, my, 
my first experiences with music technology uh, really came probably around like middle school or so. So that would have been like 2002-ish when home computer recording uh, first started to get uh, like affordable and decent sounding. Uh, before that, it was it was kind of prohibitively expensive, and uh, uh, or really really technically challenging, or kind of kind of lame, and and you couldn't make a a decent sounding record with it. Um, but my dad, you know, fortunately as a graphic designer, he had a pretty nice Mac back when that was a lot less common, and uh, it could run some of the uh, some of the recording software at the time. Uh, so I got to play around with like MIDI instruments and and uh, all sorts of uh, kind of fun techniques for uh, playing my my instruments into the computer and um, and experimenting with making music digitally pretty much as early as that was accessible to uh, average home studio users. Um, and then graduating from high school, I went to industrial design school at Western Washington. They have a really great program there. Um, had an incredible time. Met, you know, worked alongside some amazing, uh, amazing students, and have gone on to do really incredible things. And uh, I think the the one downside is music kind of left my life for a while. Uh, you know, as we all know, design school is can be pretty brutal in terms of work schedule, and uh, didn't have a lot of time to engage with music making. Um, outside of the, the ID studio. But uh, when I graduated from industrial design, I, uh, I did get a job in the housewares industry. And more than that, I had you know, a lot more time on my hands, uh, not being in the studio 24 hours a day and, and, and whatnot. So I kind of got back into music, but I didn't quite have enough time to like play in bands and, you know, uh, get a practice space and coordinate all of that. So um, I started making electronic music, which this was back in maybe 2011, 2012. So um, electronic music was really uh, getting much, much more popular in the United States at that time. And uh, there was a lot of uh, kind of interesting music happening on, on SoundCloud. I don't know if anybody... Uh, any of you used that back in its its kind of its heyday? It's discovering really cool music all the time at work. <laughs> you know, while while at work, I was listening to new music and kind of wanting to make it myself and and involve myself in that scene. Um, so at my day job, I was uh, working at a then pretty small company in Seattle called uh, True Brands that makes beverage tools and accessories, like got to design a lot of glassware, a lot of bar tools, uh, cocktail shakers, corkscrews, drinkware, um, really a uh, really great foundation in industrial design for me and uh, got to visit factories in China a whole bunch and, and really uh, learn how products are made and, um, and kind of cut my teeth on, on figuring that side of industrial design out, kind of the, the stuff they don't teach you as much in school. Um, and about six, five or six years into my job as an industrial designer, I uh, decided I wanted to move into more of a brand management role at True. So, because uh, product briefs were being handed down to the industrial design team and, um, you know, we would work within the confines of that brief and within the, uh, the, uh, the, the strategic direction set out by the brand managers. And I thought, well, hey, you know, why can't I set some of that strategic direction and decide uh, what gets designed, not just how we design it? Um, and that really taught me how a product business really works, like the financial side of it, um, a little bit into the marketing side of it. Uh, taught me a lot about sales and working with customers um, and what their needs and and wants are. So I think that was a really formative experience for me and something, even though uh, definitely uh, my industrial design activities 
slowed down a lot in that job. I still did a little bit of industrial design. Um, it was it was definitely worth it. I was doing that for about a year, um, and at around the same time that I that I started that, I actually met my future business partner Michael on a city bus in Seattle. Which, if anyone here has lived in Seattle or uh, uh, spent any time around here, would know that that is like extremely unlikely and kind of a a, a bolt of lightning freak experience because um, people people are kind of quiet and uh, and um, antisocial in Seattle I would say uh, for the most part so um, I was sitting on the bus coming home from work one day and uh, I heard somebody behind me talking about this Eurorack stuff that I had gotten into a year or two before and I thought that was just like the the weirdest thing ever to hear on a bus like well, what are the chances that I would run into someone uh, anyone who's really into this super niche hobby so we you know exchange info and started hanging out and you know over the next six months just started um, building product together because he is a uh, electrical and software engineer who was working at Google at the time um, really unbelievably smart guy and uh, also into this this weird little hobby is mine. So um, I think it was a it was a, a super fortuitous blend of my experience as an industrial designer and brand manager, kind of business owner, and his technical experience um, developing the hardware and software that makes these things tick. Um, so don't know why this is turned to the left, but uh, we went to a trade show in spring of 2019 um, in Berlin. It's like the big synthesizer convention for the world and showed some prototypes of our first products. We actually had one product on the market already by then. Um, just It had just recently launched at like the beginning of 2019. So. We hadn't seen a ton of sales. Uh, definitely, I would say at that point, it was still kind of like a hobby business, like like something we did uh, a couple times a week at night after work, um, but weren't quite sure like, you know, what it looked like or, or what it was gonna be like to, uh, to, to make it a bigger part of our lives. But in winter of 2019, a, a really big YouTuber in the modular community uh, released a video of one of our products that we had sent him uh, to, do a, to do a feature on. And it just like completely blew everything out of the water um, in terms of sales. It, we sold out of it immediately. Um, it, was, it was just really wild to see the power of of online marketing like that um, in real time and, and experience it on, on my own business. So I uh, made the plunge to leave my full-time job in 2019. Um, I still do a little consulting work for, for True and love working with them, but uh, I wanted to devote more time to this business and uh, make it like a, a bigger part of my focus and my Activities and see where it could go. And, uh, you know, from January ish 2020 till now, we just can't produce enough of these things to stay in stock. Um, we are producing electronics at like a really, really small scale. So that comes with all of its own challenges. Um, but it's, it's really been a, it's been a wild ride and, and uh, definitely some days feels kind of unreal that it's, that it's actually working. Um, and we're, uh, you know, incredibly lucky to be able to sell these things to musicians and hobbyists and tinkerers all over the world now. Um, I think we're in retailers in about five countries, but those retailers sell to many, many more countries. And um, it's it's just really cool to hear from people and see what people are doing with them. Like that video I just showed earlier uh, was made by someone who we sent product to and uh, there's just there's a really incredible community around this product um, that's been a, a real joy to work in. So uh, in this talk, I, 
my main objective is to give uh, an industrial designer, um, hopefully some of you who are thinking about maybe starting a product business someday, kind of a, a little bit of a framework to evaluate product business opportunities. Um, you know, industrial designers are really good at uh, coming up with product ideas, like like the product solution side, and uh, and making them and and making them really beautiful and and wonderful. Um, but I think there's you know when you're starting a product business, there's a lot of foundation that sits underneath that uh, that allows a a wonderful product experience to be successful. And that's kind of what I want to cover here in some high level concepts and, and hopefully um, sort of provoke some discussion and, and, and get some good questions coming in. Uh, Cause a lot of this is incredibly um, subjective to individual business opportunities and individual uh, markets. So uh, I'll, I'll give my experience and my, uh, uh, take on this as it pertains to modular synthesizers, which is kind of this very uh, specific industry. But um, I think these these questions can be asked about a lot of different markets, and um, and hopefully uh, get you uh, moving towards a, a successful idea. And of course, I'm still figuring this out, as you saw from the timeline. Like I haven't been running a business for that long. Uh, we're definitely still in like a young growth phase as a business. Uh, so I can't uh, speak back on, you know, 20 years of experience or something to really uh, give a full picture of, of where I've been. We're definitely still more, I'm more thinking about where we're going than where we've been at this point. Um, and I think it also is prudent for me to uh, kind of, touch on the fact that uh, my ideas here aren't so much about like building a venture scale business or building a software business. Um, the word entrepreneurship is kind of a loaded term these days and often refers to these things, I think, um, in a lot of the things you'll read, uh, a lot of the, the advice that's given on you know, Twitter and <laughs> elsewhere out there. So. Uh, I'm more speaking about creating like a lifestyle business. So a, a fun, sustainable product business that uh, will bring in enough money to support you someday, um, but maybe uh, isn't uh, attractive to like an investor or, um, uh, and it's also my experience is in creating physical, a physical product business. So um, software is a quite different, ball game from that overall. So just wanted to clarify that. Um, yeah, so the first thing I uh, wanted to touch on is, is who should you start a business with? Um, you know, as industrial designers and, uh, you know, eventual business leaders, we can start businesses by ourselves. And there is a, there is a fair bit that an industrial designer can do um, in terms of, uh, manufacturing and selling a product. But I think with a co-founder, even just one, there are so, so many other options or, and possibilities of markets you can, you can play in that open up, depending on uh, who that co-founder is and the kinds of skills they bring to the table. Um, and the most important factor is definitely trust. Um, when you're when you're deciding to jump into this with someone, you know you're going to be uh, risking a lot of money together. Um, things are going to go wrong, <laughs> for sure. It's like a guarantee. Um, so you have to really think about even if they're your friend, even if they're someone that you love spending time with, and you're going to spend a ton of time together. Um, are they someone who you would like? loan say a thousand dollars to right now or uh you know if if some really stressful bad news comes in from a customer how do you think they would uh handle that situation um would they be able to stay cool and just kind of and work through it and that's really 
that's really what you want. Um, and beyond being your friend and someone you want to spend a lot of time with and being very trustworthy, I think it's it's kind of important to evaluate what else a co-founder can bring to the table. Um, and I, I kind of break those down into knowledge, money, connections, or skills, um, or a combination of those, ideally a combination. And, you know, you can always bring these things to the table as well. That's the in, implied uh, message behind this as well. Um, so with knowledge, uh, like that could be an electrical engineer, or software engineer, or even someone who's really, really good at marketing, like uh, you know, online conversion marketing, someone who really knows how to take the beautiful product you designed and really get it out in front of people in a profitable way. Or it could be an attorney, someone who knows how to write a patent. Um, so someone who brings like another piece of the puzzle together um, with you. And of course, money is important in starting a business. Um, that could be, you know, wealthy friends or family or, and I would say like money is really, really important in the beginning. It gets you off the ground. It allows you to buy your initial inventory, allows you to pay for advertising and operational expenses. It's, if that's the only thing that someone brings to the table, it's maybe less useful in the long term um, because hopefully, you know, in this kind of business, uh, the business is making money fairly quickly and you're able to reinvest that. Um, but, but something to definitely think about. Um, connections. So that could be like a industry insider, someone who knows a market inside and out, maybe has a pre prior work experience in a market you'd like to develop a product for and would be able to uh, like open doors to get that product into retailers or get it in front of important decision makers. Uh, someone who knows a lot of wealthy people <laughs> and can get you funding. Though again, I'm not really speaking to like venture funded businesses here. I don't have any experience in that. Um, in fact, the uh, creative session guys uh, gave a great overview in their lens on that. And I highly recommend watching that if you're, if you're interested in that scene. Um, or someone who knows a lot of your future customers. So uh, they're maybe like a, a power user of the product or, or someone who has like really deep knowledge of um, the people who are going to buy this thing or use it. And I put skills on there because I think there are other businesses as well where maybe you could work with like a carpenter or an artist and someone who does the manufacturing in a very uh, artisanal way and then you handle the design and the marketing and the business development. So yeah, lots of things to look for. Uh, the next topic is customer acquisition. Uh, you'll see the term CAC, that's how this is pronounced. It stands for customer acquisition cost. And that's basically like how much will it cost to tell someone that you exist and convince them they need your product. Um, you know, when you start a brand new product company, even in a, a small community like modular synthesizers, no one knows you exist. No one knows that you're, you know, working every night in your basement to try to get this thing off the ground or that you've even manufactured things unless you can get the message out there and, uh, and get the product in front of them. And uh, I would say the, the, the CAC or the customer acquisition cost for the modular synthesizer market was actually one of the big decision points for me around uh, deciding that this was something that I actually uh, wanted to try to build a career in and try to uh, build a real business around because um, basically selling modular synthesizers is it's really easy to uh, get people to know about your product. Um, there's a whole bunch of places online um, where this product is displayed, interacted with uh, in terms of media and uh, kind of uh, shopped for in a loose sense. And I'll, I'll give some examples here because I think it's, um, 
these are obviously specific to modular synthesizers, but these kinds of things exist for other communities as well. Um, there's a, a big forum uh, for modular synthesizers that is super, super active. And, uh, you know, a lot of people are on this all day, uh, every day, just kind of cruising around and looking for new products. There's a really cool tool called Modular Grid um, where you can like arrange these virtual versions of modules into a rack that looks like uh, one of these. So you can kind of plan out your, your eventual purchase and your, your eventual plans. And I think, you know, this drives a lot of, um, uh, I guess you could call it like meditation on making a future purchase <laughs> for the customer and gets people really uh, well acquainted with, with new modules that are coming out because they pop up on here. Um, and it's, uh, you know, this is free for any manufacturer to put their module up on. Same with the forum. Um, and there's a really, really big um, YouTube community. Uh, if I can get my tab up here. Moment. Uh, so you can see, like, for one of our products here, people have just made videos on the uh, the things that the music that they've decided to make with it, um, which is incredible. And that's kind of a content flywheel where our customers make songs and uh, interesting sound design with these products. And that goes out to other future potential customers. And it all kind of um, compounds in a, a really virtuous, virtuous cycle. And there's lots of uh, like music technology, uh, kind of online magazine and, and news aggregators. When, when you release a new product, you can send out press releases to these things. And of course, podcasting is, is huge these days. There's a couple uh, modular synthesizer podcasts. So all of this, I think, um, comes together into a very uh, affordable and accessible and effective marketing funnel for this market. And the buying power of the individual customer in, uh, in this market is also very high. Um, you know, it, it's kind of a joke in, in the modular synthesizer world that these things are really addictive and you end up spending <laughs> way too much money on them because people are so enthused about this hobby. Um, but, you know, as a manufacturer, that means that people are going to buy your future products that you come out with every time you know, if they're a big fan of your company, they'll buy every new product you come out with and they can all be effectively used together. So there's really no um, upper limit on the lifetime value of each of your individual customers. Um, that's often abbreviated as LTV. And uh, it also has, a, you know, it's a small market. Uh, it's kind of niche, I'm sure. You know, a lot of you have, have never heard of this <laughs> before, but it is growing. It's definitely growing within the music, um, music production scene. And, uh, you know, that's a, you definitely want to be in a market that is, that is expanding. Um, so I'm a, you know, a strong believer because of this in, in general, as a, you know, as like a small bootstrap business, uh, selling expensive things to fewer people who really love what you do. And uh, the way I kind of explain that is that like, um, I mean, the number of customers who are easy to find in any given market is gonna vary a little bit, but if you think about it, that could be like your friends and your friends of friends and like people who are already hanging out on forums and like, the group of people, kind of your power users, who are already like really, really ready to buy, they're going to be pretty easy and generally uh, affordable to convert. They're the the CAC for converting them into a sale will be low, um, and if you can send sell them something fairly high priced, you don't have to sell as many things to. Um, 
as many people. Um, so it's it's kind of, I think operationally, in my opinion, easier to run a business like that. Um, obviously, that is only a, a few small segments of uh, of the product markets available out there. Um, like most of the things we buy at the grocery store um, or at like a hardware store probably wouldn't fall under that, um, under this philosophy. But I think if you're gonna start a small independent business, especially as an industrial designer, because uh, I think the industrial designer's secret weapon is that we're, we're exceptionally good at making products that people really love and really delightful products. And um, we're gonna be able to address the needs of a power user because we can turn those directly into like a really high performance product that they can use. Um, so I, I'm a believer in this, this strategy for sure. And the other side of things I wanna talk about is distribution. Um, so this is what a lot of distribution looks like these days, um, where a bunch of brands sell through like a single retailer, like someone like Amazon, who's then sells to all of the customers and they kind of control the customer relationship. Um, you can definitely make a lot of money this way. And I think a lot of, for a lot of products, uh, this works really well and can build really successful businesses. It's not really something I'm super interested in. Um, and I think it can be really challenging as well if the, if the platform you're dealing with, the retailer is uh, challenging to work with. Um, whereas the modular synthesizer industry looks a little bit more like this, where you have a bunch of brands selling to a whole bunch of different retailers in different countries around the world who then sell to a whole bunch of customers all over the world as well. And there's kind of a unique advantage there where um, you know an individual brand doesn't have to do the distribution to every single person around the world who's interested in their product. Because um, shipping internationally can be really challenging and uh, import duties can be really expensive um, in some countries. So uh, each of the retailers in the modular synthesizer world tend to be uh, very online based um, as well. So they, uh, they are able to each cover a pretty large geographical uh, region, which um, essentially makes it really easy to get your, get your product out in front of and easily available to a whole bunch of people um, in a whole bunch of different places in the world, which is kind of a, a brand new thing in a way in, in e-commerce and uh, some of these online marketing uh, platforms that I've discussed earlier. Uh, and I think it's, it's a really exciting thing for uh, developing kind of niche products that, you know, if acid rain technology had to rely only on the customers in like the Seattle area to subsist off of, we could never do it. Uh, we probably do uh, half of our sales in Europe um, and uh, our sales in the United States are all over the country. So um, I think it's, it allows uh, a small business to, to be successful um, selling to like a, a whole bunch of people who um, in one city would be a really small number of people. Like I don't actually know that many people in Seattle who are interested in this hobby, um, but I've you know, met a lot of people around the world who are. Um, so we sell in kind of three different ways. We sell uh, to these retailers all over the world. We, we do have a direct to consumer site on our web store and um, we go to synthesizer trade shows and like synthesizer fairs and we can sell directly there in person with a little credit card reader. Um, so lots of different ways to, to start up a business like that. And that leads me into uh, like the, the stack that we use, some of our, uh, our uh, processes and, and technologies that we use. Hopefully this can be helpful for some of you who are thinking about uh, getting a business off the ground. 
Um, I would say another really attractive thing about developing these music electronics is the, uh, the cost structure of developing a product. Um, our research prototyping and tooling costs are quite low overall compared to a lot of the things I worked on in the housewares industry where you have to inv invest in big injection molding tools, um, put up a lot of money up front. Um, and also like the housewares industry is so broad, it's kind of hard to get a really accurate picture of your customer and what their wants and needs are and, and what they're interested in versus in a, uh, in modular synths, the uh, the customer profile is so much narrower that I have like a lot of personal friends who are like super indicative of the average customer for these things, and I can ask them questions. I have like a Discord group that I throw ideas out at and uh, and kind of get feedback on new product ideas. Um, so that makes uh, that makes market research a lot more effective and and affordable. Um, research and development is, is, is pretty easy with um, the service called PCB way that we use where you can get, uh, you can get PCBs made like printed circuit boards, what that stands for, really, really affordably in, in China and shipped uh, really, really quickly over here that we can assemble and build prototypes with. And like McMaster and Mauser sells like electronic components and all together, uh, really we can prototype much faster than we can think. So um, it's, it's a really great um, situation to be in and we're able to, we're able to turn an idea into a real product uh, reasonably fast, as fast as just two people can do it. Really, I think uh, our time is the, the major constraint there. Again, we have just kind of small setup fees that we pay to make the PCBs for production and to uh, get our aluminum front panels milled. Uh, we get these guys made at a vendor in Germany that does a really, really good job. Um, but there's no like injection tools um, or anything that is like a huge financial risk on a single product. Um, the only risk is like buying inventory ahead of the time. Uh, and our profit per unit, because it's like a very niche product, um, that's reasonably expensive uh, is, is quite high. So we don't have to sell zillions of these things to build a, like a business that could support two people full time long term. And we use uh, some software, like we use Shopify. I'm a, I'm a huge Shopify bull. I think it's, it's an amazing tool for small businesses. And um, we actually use it not only as like a web store, but as our uh, like place where we track sales and enter even sales that we do off of Shopify to retailers. And it, it has lots of great analytics tools for looking at how your business is doing and, uh, and tracking your, your progress. So highly recommend it. QuickBooks is kind of a given, uh, very important for accounting and uh, you'll definitely want to hire an accountant if you start a product, product business um, to do your books at the end of the year. Uh, a lot of money going in and out of the business and that all needs to be tracked and, um, and accounted for. And along those lines, uh, you know, getting comfortable with spreadsheets is, is important. Uh, whether that be just quickly modeling like what your margins are gonna look like for a new product or, how much money you need to buy parts or inventory. Um, it's really, spreadsheets are your best friend. <laughs> and I, I've gotten to a place where I really, you know, I really enjoy building them. It gives me a lot of peace of mind when I have something accurately modeled in a spreadsheet uh, versus just kind of loosely bouncing around in my head. Um, so, you know, I know a lot of people have an aversion to it, but I think they can be, they can be fun. If you, if you use them to make your life simpler. And we use this uh, software called Eagle by Autodesk that's our PCB layout software. I don't actually use CAD in this business, funny enough. I, uh, you know, everything's kind of 2D. It's these 
these circuit boards that are designed in Eagle, and then I design the front panels in Adobe Illustrator and send off, uh, you know, vector files to get them milled and screen printed. And uh, I'd like to talk about maybe some of my, my personal experiences uh, running a product business. I think there's like upsides and downsides and what I call weird sides, just, just kind of things I don't know exactly how to feel about. Um, the biggest upside for sure is decoupling your time and your income. So, you know, you do spend a ton of time developing a product um, and doing all the prototyping and all the, the preparation for manufacturing. And, you know, you're not, you're not getting paid by the hour for that time, but when you, you get paid later on, um, if that product's successful and you keep getting paid, even if you're not still working on it. And there's really, you know, not much else in the world that works like that. Um, and that's, that's the thing that really, um, from a lifestyle perspective, drove me towards starting a product business and uh, ideally uh, making that income my primary income long term. You have a lot more control over your time as well. You know, you're your own boss and that definitely uh, can be challenging as well in terms of maintaining motivation and, uh, and a rigorous schedule and, and getting things done. Um, I think another exciting thing for me is you have kind of a non-intermediated relationship with the economy and with markets. So like you're selling, you know, as a business owner directly to consumers. So if your product idea, you know, is good, it sells, or if it's popular, it sells. If it's not good, it doesn't sell. There's no bureaucracy between you and the end customer, which I, I really enjoy. Um, I think it, it helps me. I enjoy having like a very uh, human relationship with our customers and really understanding them uh, very directly. And that was, that was more challenging in the housewares industry. It's, it's a little more corporate, a little more, um, it's, it, the scale is so much bigger that it's hard to focus on any individual customer. Um, and then you can also look at starting a small product business as getting paid for your personal portfolio work. Um, so I know like the, the industrial designers conundrum, if you're working at like a, as an in-house designer or especially at a consultancy, you know, you can't show a lot of your work um, that you're currently working on, which is, you know, probably your best work because it's your latest. Um, so we all do a lot of personal projects as industrial designers and we do them for free uh, to make images, to put on the internet and put in our portfolios. But you know, if you can, if you can without a ton of investment or, or risk turn one of those into like a really tiny business, you can kind of get paid for that as well, which I think is you know, not only great with money, but it can teach you even more things in terms of how viable your, your personal project idea actually is. Um, so there are downsides as well. Um, there's a lot of financial risk involved. You know, like I mentioned earlier, your time and your income are decoupled, which means at first you have no income when you start a product business and you have to be in a financial position to be able to, to manage that, um, whether that be saving up money uh, while you're working at a a day job like I did for several years um, to have a nice cushion to fall back on um, or you know meeting a co-founder who can who can kind of put some seed money into the business um, there's definitely uh, it, it can be kind of challenging financially to get into it at the beginning there's definitely no one to fall back on or blame for your mistakes and your failures um, it's a very high accountability uh, career choice, which maybe not for everyone. I really enjoy that, um, but it can be scary at times. I, 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 won't, I won't say that it's not, uh, you know, pretty terrifying when a, a customer complaint comes in or a, a, a problem with the product and you have to just figure it out. You know, there's no one else to do the work. 
and it can involve some some tedious work outside of your area of interest now i also look at that as like a learning opportunity things like accounting um you know legal stuff getting a trademark uh learning like supply chain issues and fit and inventory planning uh i guess i personally enjoy like the activity of operating a business so it's kind of the the uh, combination of all of these things together but there are there are some individual tasks that I kind of will drag my feet on and and maybe procrastinate a little bit because I don't enjoy doing them but it's all a part of the uh, it's all a part of the whole experience um, and then the weird stuff you know there are there are no deadlines in running your own business but that's obviously kind of a a, a, a trick <laughs> in that you know it can also feel like there are you know unlimited immediate deadlines like you have to do everything right away and finding that balance for yourself is is really a weird process and, and something i'm definitely still working on um, just a few years into this you you get to work directly with um, a bunch of different disciplines like uh, accountants, uh, lawyers, business owners, like retail business owners, uh, manufacturers, suppliers all over the world. Um, and I did have some experience doing that in uh, my job in the housewares world, um, you know, going to Asia and working with manufacturers and then eventually working with like customers directly doing some selling and I really enjoy that it's it's very very different from sort of the design studio life that I think a lot of industrial designers definitely in school experience um, and I think in some uh, consulting and corporate environments have a bit more of like you know most of your friends are designers most of your colleagues are designers and you're kind of in a in a bit of a, a design environment like that so this is a big departure from that um, there's a lot of context switching in running a business, kind of like what I mentioned earlier with some of the tedious tasks that you have to uh, get done, you know, week in and week out, or or things that that interrupt you uh, as you're trying to develop products and and force force you to take your attention away from maybe product design because you need to deal with taxes or you know uh, a shipment got lost and you need to track it down and suddenly that's the rest of your day so i think having being mentally flexible and able to uh change change contexts uh fairly quickly is is a big advantage it's something again that i'm i'm definitely working on my my job for the longest time in housewares was very much the traditional like in CAD all day, deep focus um, and uh, kind of narrow focus on one part of this, this whole process, but I enjoy it as well. And you know, you never stop learning. And I think the other, the, the final weird one that I'll, that I'll touch on is it's a, it's a kind of uncommon career path to start a small business selling products uh maybe mine has been exceptionally uncommon because you know my parents when they they talk to their friends and try to explain what these things are and and what i do for a living it's it, it can be a little challenging <laughs> um so i think like your your friends and family will will maybe worry about you especially because it comes with some financial risk and it's some uh some kind of unconventional living choices my Fiance has been, you know, eternally patient with this, and I, I could not be more thankful for that. Um, but you know, keeping that in mind as you as you take the plunge and and kind of move into this is important. And uh, prioritizing your mental health and explaining what you're doing to those who are in your life is is really really important. Um, something to be mindful of. So uh, I guess to close out here, I, I just have some some thoughts <laughs> I threw at the end of this presentation that you know can maybe spark some discussion or uh, or, or things you can think about as you're thinking about your um, your product business ideas and and 
where you might go with this this journey. Uh, and the first is that you can always strategically lower prices in the future, and it's super hard to raise prices. So that that goes back to my my belief in selling relatively expensive things to fewer people. Um, you know, if you leave the door open internally to like maybe switching manufacturers someday to get lower pricing at a larger quantity or changing, doing like a V2 um, product that's more, you know, cost engineered, your customers will, will love that you've made a lower cost product that is also great. Um, customers never like that you raised prices you know there's there's just like no there's just no situation in which you know you can try adding features you can try you know making something more exclusive but i think it's a more powerful position to be able to strategically lower prices in the future and that can be done you know in response to a competitor that follows you onto the market um, they come in at a price that that they think is competitive with your product and then you undercut them with your planned um, price change that you've had in your back pocket the whole time. So something to think about. I'm also a big proponent of working in a space where you are a power user. Um, and the way I, I, I kind of justify that is that your intuition um, can allow you to make faster decisions when developing products. Um, because you already kind of instinctually know like how the product should be. And you, you do definitely have to like, you know, check yourself and make sure you're not getting into like a, a thought bubble um, where you're not running your product by anyone else. But I think overall, um, you know, and I am, I am biased because I'm making like a very niche product in an industry that I have a lot of, you know, prior experience in. But I think it's, I think especially as an industrial designer, um, it's a very powerful advantage because you have the technical ability to turn those um, those intuitive ideas directly into product features, um, which I think is really cool. Um, I would also recommend like scaling your product idea to your present abilities and budget uh, because you need to get to the market and see how your idea works in real life and in real time. Um, being too, uh, how do I put this, like too ambitious to the extent that, or choosing a, um, choosing a product space where you don't currently have like any of the resources to operate in is, is you know, possible very, very long term, but you know, it's it's going to delay the moment at which you're able to launch a product and and get real user feedback that is going to you know allow you to make steering decisions and and grow your business much faster. So, um, and that kind of ties in with uh, this sort of. It, it it sounds like a trick statement, like not spending too little or too much um, on your business. But uh, you know, this is tricky to figure out. Like, money is the kind of the rocket fuel that allows you to grow and allows you to buy more inventory, make more sales. And if you spend too little, you're gonna like throttle your growth uh, to a to an extent where you're not gonna be able to grow fast grow enough to be able to like support yourself on the profit of your business. Um, but if you spend too much, you'll obviously run out of money too fast and, uh, and uh, you know, maybe not get your product launched or, uh, you know, not be able to afford further inventory. So uh, thinking about how to finance your company is, is, a, is a really important, um, really important part of starting a business. Um, and this is something that, that I think came up in a past after lens and is a, a thing I've been thinking a lot about um, how design is like juggling. And uh, I've 
brought up a whole bunch of topics here and a whole bunch of like uh, maybe things that are are new to a lot of younger designers or design students. And I think it can be intimidating, uh, especially as a younger designer, to feel like you know you have to learn everything all at once, and you need to you need to be an amazing sketcher and incredible at CAD and rendering and know how to run a business and <laughs> you know an incredible speaker and presenter, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but I like to make a juggling metaphor where you should actually start by juggling only a few bowling pins. So maybe that's like sketching and CAD and rendering. And work on getting like really good technique and really good, um, really confident um, being able to uh, to juggle those those few um, those few things. And then over time, you add pin after pin after pin till you know a lot of the uh, you know really successful products out there and really impressive. Uh, industrial designers and product development teams, they're juggling like 20, 30, 40, 100 different things in order to make these products come together. But they've learned how to do that over time. So you know, don't be too hard on yourself at first. Um, design is a, is a very uh, long game profession. And you know, I'm only 31 and I have a long, long career ahead of me still. And I'm still, you know, through starting this product business, I'm adding pins one by one to my juggling and, uh, you know, learning, learning new things every year. Uh, here's one of my favorite quotes. Um, that you can't be normal and expect abnormal returns. Uh, I try to remember this when, on the days that I kind of get imposter syndrome around being an entrepreneur and starting a business, I find it kind of difficult to, you know, believe that I'm like a real company owner and that this company is real because it started from nothing. You know, it, it, sales grew slowly over time to where it was kind of like, oh, this is a hobby that makes a little bit of money to, oh, like I'm actually drawing a paycheck off of this. But it, you know, some days it, it it still doesn't feel real, <laughs> and uh, uh, it I I can you know question myself as to whether I should have you know left a full time career or pursued something else. But I think you know what I'm trying to do here is chase after somewhat abnormal returns, and that requires an abnormal approach. And finally, uh, you know just being a nice person and a real person when you start a product business. Um, that's something I really enjoy about selling, you know, music technology to people is that you can have really genuine um, relationships with your customers. Um, I think, you know, in this era of like online marketing and like, uh, you know, kind of, abstraction of the customer <laughs> into uh, into like Instagram ad metrics and uh, and whatnot uh, I think this gets forgotten sometimes that you know your customers are people and they love to hear from you and they love to know that that you as the business owner and the person who's making the products they enjoy actually cares about them so I really recommend trying to trying to be as real as possible with them. And I thought I'd make a few uh, book recommendations here at the end in case any of you are interested in, in reading further into some of this and, and increasing your knowledge base. Um, the Personal MBA by Josh Kaufman is, it's a great like 101 level introduction to a lot of business concepts that I definitely didn't learn in industrial design school. Um, and I had to kind of like pick up along the way. And I think uh, this can demystify some of those things that, that I didn't quite understand going into this. 
this is and I apologize to the, for these covers business books are <laughs> are not known for their uh, for their uh, graphic design but um, this book seven powers is incredible it's about business strategy uh, mostly kind of in the software space and, and with large venture scale businesses but um, it goes over like the moat around really successful businesses and how they're sort of inherently positioned for success. And I think that's a huge, that kind of thinking is incredibly important in evaluating a, uh, a business space and a, and a business idea. And I, I really, really recommend it. It's also very short. It's a really engaging read. Um, this is another of my favorites. Um, it's the, David Ogilvy was a uh, ad agency head in the, I think the 50s and the 60s, uh, like uh, classic Madison Avenue ad agencies in, in New York. And this is another short book. It's, <laughs> it's really amazing to, to hear kind of like a marketing genius's take on, on advertising and how much some of those have, uh, some of those ideas remain incredibly valid today. Um, and this book is also hilarious. It's, it's like hot Twitter takes 60 years before Twitter was invented. Um, so also really, really recommend it. Um, and then this is like my favorite pair of design books, uh, the sort of polar opposites, also both incredible books. I highly recommend kind of bouncing back and forth between them. Dieter Rams and Atuari Sotsas are two of my favorite designers and they take just, just incredibly different approaches to how to think about product and product like uh, objects purpose in people's lives. So um, yeah, I recommend both of these for sure. And uh, I have to shout out to the Minor Details Discord. Um, it's been an unbelievable community, especially as someone who's running their own small business uh, without other industrial designers around. And it's, it's kind of my, uh, I, I think of it as like the virtual studio that, <laughs> that I'm a part of, at least from a, from a social, st uh, social uh, standpoint and there's a business channel in this discord that we talk about these kinds of things um, all the time on and I highly recommend coming in there talk about your product idea product business ideas and um, and uh, yeah let's discuss it that was great thank you so much I wasn't too rambly <laughs> Now my camera's totally blown out. Um, do you still have a couple minutes to answer a few questions? We've got a few in the chat. I have some. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so we will start with, uh, what design challenges arise while designing music equipment that don't tend to arise in other areas of design, such as in the housewares industry? That's a really good one. Um, yeah, there. Uh, I think the biggest difference is like the, uh, at least in my experience, and I know this isn't true across housewares, because housewares is a huge industry and, and, and really, really a diverse space with, uh, you know, I, I have never worked on like cooking tools, for instance. I, I know there's like incredible enthusiasts in that space. Um, but I think in, in most of the products I worked on, the level of engagement of the average customer is much, much higher in music gear. Like, uh, you know, music technology is generally speaking, our customer's primary hobby, kind of like scuba diving or like, you know, playing, uh, well, yeah, scuba diving and maybe like uh, tricking out your car or something like that are good analogies in terms of like how much people think about these things. So um, being really, uh, you know, you, you really definitely have to get it right in music technology because people will complain loudly online if you don't <laughs> and uh, or if you you know your product isn't working as well as it should so the bar is very high in in music technology but I really like that as an industrial designer because you know we're we're good at making good products as as designers so awesome 
we had a question here that I thought was nice because it's a bit it's a bit polarizing. Um, so it's by J J Net, I think. Um, have you thought about uh, the potential of varied materials that are more environmentally conscious? Um, and I think the assumption here is that the product is partially plastic. There isn't any plastic in our products. Um, I'll show it again here. I, I couldn't see myself on screen, so I'm not sure how the video uh, came in. It's, uh, it's made out of um, an anodized aluminum panel and then a bunch of uh, electronics components that are soldered onto a circuit board. Um, I think the, the question still is apt though, because you know the consumer electronics industry is incredibly resource intensive. Um, at the scale that we're operating with, at um, you know, our impact is not huge in compared to you know cell phones or uh, sm smart home devices that are made in the, the millions and millions. Um, so, yeah, environmental impact is something that um, I think uh, the the main approach that I take to it is that um, we do make our products in the US actually. I saw a question here about uh, whether they're made in China. Mm -hmm. um, all the subcomponents are made in, in China and Taiwan, like all these little tiny, um, little tiny components that get soldered onto the, uh, onto PCBs are, are all, that's the only place they're made in the world. And they're made, you know, in billions of of units quantities um, so we don't have control over that obviously um, but we do try in terms of labor um, we like to keep that in the u.s we have a manufacturer in portland oregon that uh, specializes in making music technology they're a really small contract manufacturer incredible people they're like all synth nerds themselves the people soldering these things together um, so I like that our money goes back into supporting the community. Um, and then it's also, you know, I used to have to go to China all the time to, to monitor production and work with manufacturers. And getting on a three-hour train ride down to Portland is a lot easier and uh, more fun sometimes. So. Especially to meet up with a bunch of like-minded people, too. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I guess this, this kind of goes along with... Uh, the business side of it. So this is by Steve. In your view, should my company be borrowing money to grow and expand? After several years of growing the company, I have yet to take a salary. Am I being too meek and boot bootstrapping versus going all in and selling my house, etc.? <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's a heavy one. I like that question. I, I cannot in good conscience uh, <laughs> uh, uh, encourage you to do that. But, um, you know, Questions like this are um, super subjective and specific to the business. Uh, Steve, I you know feel free to uh, uh, come on the Discord and, and chat about it. I'd, I'd love to. I love talking about this stuff. I'm such like a, a business development nerd and like <laughs> love the just the talking about making product businesses and how they work. So. Um, I think I'd need to know a little bit more about what what you're making and how much money that takes and where the money goes. Because, you know, we're really lucky, like I talked about with the cost structure of of developing these things. There's like very little money up front other than inventory. Um, and even that's been challenging to figure out like how many units to order because you get better pricing with more units but it's a lot more money out of pocket for something that you just don't know if it's gonna it's gonna be successful or not so um, we're i would say acid rain is still like behind the curve in terms we're like catching up on inventory we've been out of stock like forever because we because of our shyness like a year ago <laughs> in terms of not buying maybe enough products to meet demand. But that sounds kind of like a good problem to have. Is it, is it actually, does it feel like a good problem? It does. Yeah. It's, it can be annoying some days, but it, I have to remind myself of that. And then um, I really like this question uh, by Auntie. Auntie. 
sorry if I'm butchering your names, guys. How do you protect your ideas and designs when you're in the testing stage or when discussing them in forums? Um, and I would actually like to know a little bit about the testing process or just the design process behind making one of these things. Yeah, I guess I, I didn't uh, cover it. That's one thing I left out and I can, I can definitely speak to that. Um, that's a really good question in terms of like the intellectual property side. Um, and we all know as industrial designers, I, I think I would gander that the average industrial designer works in a field where intellectual property concerns are really serious. Like, uh, you know, there are factories overseas ready to knock you off like the second you're successful <laughs> and uh, you, know, you have to have patents mm -hmm. and you have, you know, a legal team to, 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 to handle that. Um, modular synthesizers uh, fly under the radar for a bit. It's a small enough industry and it's super niche and it's super distributed across a lot of manufacturers that I don't think there's enough people interested in any one product to make like a lower cost knockoff viable, if that makes sense. Because you need to have like a huge market that you could that w is willing to step down to the knockoff rather than buy the original. Um, and we see that even in housewares, you know, companies like uh, some of the European housewares companies get knocked off all the time, but they're still really successful because enough of their market cares enough to buy the real thing. Um, and I think that's, I think that's definitely true in, in music tech. Uh, there's very little compared to housewares for sure. There's very little like patent activity and, and intellectual property uh, concern. Yeah. Speaking, okay, so speaking of music tech, um, I was curious about this uh, for a while, I guess only a few days, but so you're making these synth pieces um, with the digital music. Yeah. Whoever or will you ever, or do you ever want to design, I guess, like a more traditional musical instrument like a guitar yeah well as you can see behind me i play guitar <laughs> um i i maybe it's a very different market uh ours i i know uh you know it would be kind of a it would be challenging to actually build a guitar and move into it that's that's mostly woodworking really uh, in terms of and i'm not i'm not that great of a woodworker and i live in an apartment so i'm fortunate that these things are tiny so running a business from home these days in COVID is doable because they don't take up that much space. Boxes <laughs> um, and boxes of guitars. Oh, yeah. On top of them. <laughs> right. Um, I've thought about getting into guitar pedals and, you know, technology that's adjacent to the guitar space, but. That would be really cool. That's kind of the other thing that I think is great about music technology is once you build a brand, in the space you can go all sorts of different directions and five years from now we could be doing big products that are not modular synths or keyboards or some weird i don't know i've been thinking a lot about like uh music technology for people to use while they're working at home and <laughs> it's kind of some some new spaces opening up there so lots of lots of ideas more ideas than we can than we have time to to build for sure you've got a really good backlog then <laughs> yeah definitely um so has the pandemic uh clearly it's affected the way you're working um do you see it affecting the music industry um either short term or long term and do you think that it'll last yeah that's a really good question um it has affected how I work a bit. We've actually been, my partner and I have been remote since before the pandemic. He uh, lives in North Carolina and is actually moving down to Portland, Oregon soon. So, and it's just the two of us. It's, it's pretty doable to do a remote company with just two people. Um, that's another big advantage. Something I really, I really enjoy about running a really small company is that it's just operationally so easy. There's, there's no, you know, difficult bureaucracy or like office politics or anything like that to deal with. Um, 
there's not too many. Which is, I think. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's just the two of us um, and no employees. So we don't have, uh, we fortunately haven't had the stress of like having to lay anyone off for mm -hmm. COVID. Um, the belt can kind of tighten and expand as the good times and the hard times come. Um, COVID has, has definitely, um, it's affected the music industry a lot in terms of musicians. I mean, the musicians were relying on live shows almost entirely for income before this. And um, now that's, that's pretty much drawn down to zero. So we have yet to see what the next, you know, generation of of the music industry looks like you know streaming isn't isn't even really that old if you think about it you know i remember when spotify came to the us like when i was in college and there was itunes before that and then it was cd's before that so i think we'll continue to see evolution in that space i i don't think streaming is the end of music consumption um i'm very very lucky that the music technology space has thrived actually in this time. Um, you know, it's a very indoor hobby at home. Uh, you, it's something to kind of take your mind off your your day job from home as well. I, um, and I imagine people who are buying these things maybe aren't uh, out spending money on as many other things. It's it's hard to know exactly, but we've had continued to grow through COVID and I'm I'm thankful every day for that for sure. Yeah, that's certainly fortunate. <laughs> um, Definitely feel like I was just sitting in the right chair at the right time. Like I, <laughs> I didn't do anything. There's no strategy behind that. So I have a really good question by Akash. Um, what part of what you do is industrial design in the traditional sense? A yeah, good a good one because it's what I do now is actually like very, very different uh, from the industrial design I used to do in housewares, which was very 3D and it was like big industrial processes in terms of what I was designing for. Um, whereas what I do now, it, these things are almost two dimensional in a, in a user sense because the user only really plays with this side. Um, so I, I don't use CAD much. I use like CAD to do the PCB layout, um, but it's it's a whole different kind of CAD. Uh, I think the, I kind of describe what I do as hardware user interface design. So it's it's like, where did the buttons go and what do they do? And when someone who doesn't have the manual walks up to the module, do they know what's going on? And where your fingers fit into this little space and all of all of that kind of all of those considerations uh, come together in terms of like the prototyping I'll generally I can I can speak to the process that I use to develop these things I think you asked earlier mm -hmm. um, which is I will generally start uh, let me see if I have any yeah here we go I'll start by like drawing ideas on paper like this. I printed out like a grid that's a one-to-one -one scale with the size of these modules. And I'll like draw where the knobs might go and what, where, what the graphics might be. Um, and then once I've somewhere where I think it's like probably a, a decent idea and I think everything will fit, I'll hop into Eagle CAD, which is a PCB layout software. Mm -hmm and I'll place the components that we have in like a library of components onto a PCB that's the right size. And uh, I'll generally place like the big components, like the jacks and the buttons. And then later on, my partner, Michael, will do the like the circuits and the, the really detailed design. But I have learned a lot of electrical engineering in this job. Um, and it's. I think that's another, like I was talking about with juggling, that's another another pin that I'm working on slowly, <laughs> getting better at. Um, it's a it's a whole different, uh, whole different uh, discipline for sure. It brings me back to physics class in college. But uh, <laughs> um, yeah, so I'll move into Eagle, lay out some components, and then I'll export a DXF from Eagle and put that in Adobe Illustrator and make like a 
nicer looking mock-up and start drawing the graphics. And then I'll usually, something won't be right, and I'll go back into Eagle, move some components, export back into Illustrator, change the graphics, and eventually those line up. And I'm, I have a, like a CAD file in Eagle that is ready to like be turned into a real PCB. And then that matches up with the panel design in Illustrator simultaneously. Awesome. It's so weird where the design industry can take you, like into synth modules and electrical engineering. Yeah. <laughs> Did you ever yeah, think I mean, that you would end up here? I guess not. End. You know, this would be part yeah. of Yeah. I, until I met Michael on that bus, like before that, I had been soldering like kits together where like people would send a PCB and a bunch of components and you like, I don't really, I'd like a multimeter and I could read voltages and I, I knew a tiny bit about how electronics work, but mostly just following instructions and using a soldering iron. So I was getting into like making these things just for myself. Um, and, but before I met him, I, I had never really considered the idea of like learning electrical engineering and, and, you know, I didn't have a teacher like him <laughs> yet. So it's, it's, uh, it's definitely a, a subject that really is, has helped having someone to guide me, guide me into it and learn just the part of electrical engineering that I'm, that's relevant to making this kind of stuff. Um, I'd always, you know, kind of dreamed of getting into the music technology space only because I'd been interested in it for so long. Um, but yeah, it's, Sometimes you don't you don't see the possibility until certain things fall into place, and it's like, oh yeah, you know, I can design stuff, and here's an engineer that wants to make stuff. Now we can do it, you know. That's awesome. So you mentioned, um, I think, towards the beginning of your presentation, that you kind of started off learning guitar. You were taught by your father. Um, yeah and ended up joining a band. I wanted to know, are you still in a band? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not in a band these days, you know. Like after, after college, being in a band is challenging. Mm -hmm. There's very little rehearsal space in Seattle. Um, so it's, it's logistically difficult. It's really, really loud. So you like, can't do it at night, um, which is when you have time, if you're right. working a job, to to make music. Um, yeah, I make music myself, I like electronic music. And uh, I, I can, I guess, link to some of that maybe. I haven't released anything for a really long time because funny enough, when you get into making electronic or musical instruments, you kind of stop making music because you're too busy making products. It's a little ironic because they're designed to make music, but uh, you know. All right, well, um, it's 3.23, so we're a little over. Um, I just wanna thank everybody who's still around. Thank you guys for hanging on. Um, and Ryan, thank you so much for being part of this lens session. Um, this was recorded, so Advanced Design is gonna post it on their website pretty soon. Um, and I think that's about it. So Ryan, I believe you are the host. Um, so whenever you feel comfortable, you wanna end the meeting for everybody. Thank you again so much. Yeah, thank you.